I've been checking my Kindle publishing and I've been selling my books, A Bow Maker's Notebook. So I owe it to you to start the video series on the build-alongs for my three project bows. I have as number one project bow a simple D bow made from green wood. Green being, you know, fresh wood, you go out and you cut it, you start with a fresh piece. The second one was a board bow, uh, raw hide back, so you can, with dimensions, uh, go out, buy some red oak, create your bow, rawhide back it, and within a week you, you can have a bow because it doesn't take an incredibly long time to dry the rawhide. You can do it as a self bow. No rawhide backing, but I included the extra bit on rawhide backing. The third one, which I'm going to do first, is a gull wing sinew backed horse bow. Out of the three, I really feel, even though this one has more steps, there's more time involved, your chances of creating a good working bow are greater with this. There's several reasons. One is, sinew is an amazingly strong substance. I'll do a close-up here. Yesterday I showed you tip wrapping, and this is the quality of the wrapping if you then wrap the wrapping with plastic and enroll it with a, a coffee mug. And so the handle wrap the other tip. I'm not going to sand it. I like the texture. It's not bumpy. It's even and textured. It's good. It's a good surface. It's a cool surface. And so it's foolproof in a way that you're not going to have the back break. The other reason I really love it <coughs> is that when you impart this deflex into the limbs, you're making it less temperamental as far as tillering. If you made, say, uh, compass or circular tillered English longbow, the tillering is quite temperamental as far as getting it evenly distributed and working to get out every kink. On these, with the sinew backing and the deflex already into the limbs, a lot less temperamental. I'm not going to say you can be bad with your tillering, but you're going to stress out a lot less. A lot less. For one thing, it's not as noticeable when it is bent, a gull wing. You know, you can certainly measure the distance when it's sitting on a bench and braced, you know, from tip to tip, or measure this distance in here. But as far as practicality of use, a lot less temperamental. Another reason I like it, I said I had two, I've got more, is that it's an economy of materials. This is at the upper range for length for a usable bow. Sinew backing it allows you to make a shorter bow and, and still get a decent draw length. This is definitely a short draw bow, but it's not a micro draw bow. Economy of materials. Your staves are smaller. They're smaller in diameter. I'm going to show you some staves I cut this morning. Uh, because that crown, a crown is a rounded surface, and the smaller diameter stave you cut, the higher the crown is going to be. Sinew back bows love crowning because it concentrates tensional, um, tensional stress. And so I'm not worried about decrowning it, flattening it off, or getting a big, big stave that has a very reduced crown. I like crowns. I like crowns and sinew bag bows. So you can work with smaller materials. And let's see, another one is that you notice it's straight through here. A lot of times when you're splitting staves to make long bows, you have to pay particular attention to the orientation of your stave to make sure it lines up. Well, my friends, with this, it doesn't matter because you're gonna be cutting it green and lashing it to a board. So if it's not straight, you're gonna make it straight. Easy, easy. And so, step one. This is not a huge multiple step series on making a bow. Put that right there. It's raining, it's damp, doesn't matter. You know, the sinew isn't gonna like dissolve in the rain just have to put it inside and let it dry. The first step is in gathering wood. I get a lot of questions about wood. One would be, where do I buy Osage orange staves? I, I love Osage orange, and I'm gonna contradict myself in some ways here, but I appreciate the effect that the sinew has on there to make a lesser bow wood a good bow wood. And so, as a matter of philosophy, you look around. 
you're not going to order the wood, you're not going to pay any money for it, you're going to use what you have in hand. And so, you're looking for hardwoods unless you live where there's juniper or pacific yew. Let's go with the hardwoods. Oaks, maples, which is a supreme bow wood when it's sinew back. It's a very, I'm not going to say light because it's a dense wood, but it get, has a light, snappy feeling. Maples. You can go to the wood database or my book, and it kind of rates the different trees within each genus. Sugar maples would be a hard maple. Mountain maple, striped maple, red maple would be softer maples, but they make good bows. Ironwood. This is tricky. Remember the juniper cedar debate? Well, ironwoods are the same thing. Blue beech, American hornbeam, mussel wood is in the birch family. Then you have hop hornbeam, different genus than American hornbeam, but it's still in, in the, the, the birch family. It's also called ironwood. It's also called mussel wood. But the hornbeams, if it's called hornbeam, it's a good one. Uh, service berry, cherry. I love cherry. It doesn't have the greatest tensile strength, but it's, it has good elasticity and compression strength that makes a springy bow. Kind of on the order of juniper, genus juniperus, or Pacific yew. Not as extreme, but it mimics that. So choke cherry is a good thing. Actually, I saw two museum, museum bows, original bows, in choke cherry. One was shaped like a gall wing. The other one was backwards. And so it was kind of reflex. It was kind of a, a deflex reflex kind of a thing where the handle was shaped and then it had the recurves set deep in. It wasn't tip recurves, it was deep in. This is another style that's not talked about too much. It were actual horse bows. So you'd lash it to the board, block it up under the handle, lash it right here maybe a third of the way in from the tip and then block up this. That one is tricky. You have to pay particular attention, more attention to having it straight. And also when it's strung, you don't want to have the recurve going back or else it'll be unstable. It'll want to flip over if it's not perfectly aligned. And so you'd string those so the string would ride along here or barely be lifted. That one I'm not going to deal with. I'm going to make one out of these staves I cut but it's not going to be a demonstration bow for um, somebody just starting out. With the deep recurves like that, you have to pay particular attention to certain things or else you're going to have an unstable bow. Not worth trying, trying on your first bow. This on the other hand, if it's not aligned perfectly, it'll still be a good bow. It might be tilted a little bit, but it's stable. It's a stable design, which means that when you release your, your arrow and it rebounds back, it's not going to try to like do squirrely things with the string. So, I chose white ash. I chose white ash because I can cut it guilt free because of the emerald ash borer. The tree I cut was showing signs of decline and so it's going to die anyway. I might as well make bows out of it. I achieved the bounty of three about 50 inch staves. And so I've got the big one that's near the base, relatively straight, straight enough. The next one, and then the third one, which I'm going to work with because it's smaller to stave, the less woodwork you have to do. And the first step is you cut them to size plus some room for error because you want to be able to slide it. And then actually remove the bark. It's a fast and dirty way to do it. I'm not getting, I'm not going to get the inner bark off. I'm not going to worry about s scratching into the surface because it's going to be, they're all going to be sinew back. They're all going to be sinew back horse balls. But I just want to, over the knots and stuff. And if I have a knot on the back, it doesn't matter because it's sinew back. Now, I don't have the ability to edit, so I'm not going to subject you to watching me scrape the bark off of each one of these things. You have just mastered the technique of removing bark. It's just that simple. The, 
the next process in preparing these, after all the bark is split off, to analyze them and then to split them in the staves. I'm not worried. I am not worried about them twisting or torquing or deforming when they dry because they're going to be worked into rough bows. They're going to be lashed to the board and they're going to dry in that position. So who cares if it wants to do a twist if you're just to, to split it and then sock it away somewhere. They're going to be worked into floor tillered bows, all six of these. Six, you say? Yes. Now it is entirely possible. I'm looking at this bigger stave. I keep knocking my poor bow, but that's all right. It's rugged. It's seen you bet. It's entirely possible that you could split it into quarters or work it in the thirds. Ha ha. Yes. But you want to analyze it. Let's take a good measurement of this thing. This is 50 inches long and at the widest, doesn't matter about the crown, it's in your bag. It's over, it's actually an inch and three eighths. And so just for the heck of it, I took the small end of this big one, hold it up here, and I turned it into pie shaped thirds. Then I measured after I drew these vertical lines to signify the sides of the bow at an inch and three eighths and look at there there is absolutely no margin for error there is no margin for error so i'm not going to try to get greedy and get three out of these i'm going to just split it in half and have a little more waste but i'm not going to have the waste of turning this into thirds and then having to throw all of them out because i messed up chances are i'd get one maybe two good ones out of it but i'm not going to risk it so this will just be split in half so I've got one, two, three bows. Now as far as size, to have a reasonable crown for a bow that's an inch and three eighths wide, measuring it here, I'm gonna have quite a bit of crown. But again, I don't have to decrown it because it's sinew backed and this is gonna pose an advantage. This tree has very, I don't know if you can see it, very fine growth rings. So this is a perfect candidate for a sinew backed bow. Dense. It's not a five-year-old tree, so it doesn't have those thick, foamy growth rings because that five-year-old tree didn't have time to like suffer the, the dire consequences of wind and compensate by getting stronger. This is an older tree. This is about 20 years old. And so it's had a chance um, to start growing finer, denser growth rings. And again, not the same as Osage. With an Osage self bow, you want thicker growth rings. On this, send you back. Fine growth rings are good. Now, I could certainly put this on the ground. A lot of people split this way, you know, and just just um, baton this with a knife or use wedges or use my ax and a hammer and start splitting it. But being very careful, I am going to put this, as well as the other two, on my bench. And I'm going to take a circular saw not very primitive but using a circular saw making lines down either side i'm not going to try to cut the whole thing in half i can be off a little bit because the depth of this bow you know before the blade goes in and starts wandering and going off i'm going to be able to precisely do the sides of the bow and then that stuff where the blade wanders as it's going deeper will just be removed and use a circular saw to split this. Dangerous technique because if it jams you can kick back. So I'm reluctant to say use a circular saw to start splitting things. It's a dangerous technique. You have to be very careful if you if you are not experienced with circular saw or, or strong enough to control it or aware you know that that thing at any moment is going to try to jam and kick back and, and cut you in the gut. Don't do it. Just split it. Ash splits really easy. I could probably just split all of them, no problem. But I have experience with a circular saw. And so that'll be the next step. After I debark all these, mark them circular saw. And instead of subjecting you to an hour long video, I am going to close it at this point. Say thank you for buying my book. I'm going to finish debarking these. I'm going to mark them. The next time you see me, I'm going to have the staves. And then, using the smaller one, economy of motion, 
smaller stave, easier to woodwork. I am going to work it into a floor tillered bow because before I send you back, it's floor tillered. It's floor tillered. A little bend in the handle, but most of it taking place in the limbs. And I shall then tie one of them to a board blocked up. And the blocks I use are actually the trimmed ends of these things. Will I go for a huge bend like this? Probably not, because when you floor tiller it, you're gonna get string follow with a green board. All I'm gonna, or green stave, all I'm gonna do is get rid of that, that string follow and have a little bit of reflex, and that's my goal. As the sinew cures, you're gonna get more reflex. That's the point of this thing, that's the evolution of this thing. Was taking a piece of wood that's gonna lose, lose, lose um cast because of string follow and counteracting it with a bend back in the handle somewhat stylized yes but i'm looking at it as function functionality of the bow when you bend these things into deflex when you get the string follow you're compacting the belly wood i don't care about the tension because the sinew is going to take care of that you're compacting the belly and hopefully hitting a wall which will up till permanent deformation or failure will not gain any more strength follow. So there we are. Thank you for watching. Time for me to get some work done. Still sitting up here even though it's raining. I've got visitors here. We're going to keep marching along, hosting people, enjoying the trails until we close the gates. November 15th.